You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hi everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Faribur Spuya. In this week's program, we have a special interview with Keith Porteous Wood, the Executive Director of National Secular Society. We'll also be talking about the ceasefire in Syria, the situation of Syrian and Afghan refugees, as well as an insane fatwa on TV interviews and women playing instruments in Iran. You don't want to miss this program. Stay with us. This week we've heard of a ceasefire in Syria and of course that is great news because it will allow for areas that have been blockaded for there to be humanitarian assistance and convoy, convoys reaching civilians and of course any amount of time where civilians are not being targeted it's great however it's definitely not enough a lot more needs to be done you know and that's uh, what Syria is is a war with an end supposedly or it seems so but we've had these situations in the past unfortunately human history has had many wars like Vietnam even in Iraq we've seen and one major factor that brings the war to an end is international public opinion and international resistance and people and organized international resistance that's yeah. what we need yeah i mean the the reality is we cannot rely on the russian on the us on the iraq iranian on the turkish uh, on on these various islamist groups here there killing people indiscriminately we can't rely on them it's got to be public opinion that will bring an end to the situation as they have in many wars that seemed non that they were never going to end but of course one of the problems is that we have stopped the war coalition it, it makes me gag when i say that name excuse me that are so busy defending the Assad regime the Iranian regime that they are not mobilizing real resistance against this war because they have a stake in it absolutely and they, next month they have a meeting yes. when you look at the agenda they talk about imperialism they talk about Islamophobia they talk about you know invasion of the Middle East but they first they don't mention anything about Syria they don't mention anything about organizing public and Jeremy Corbyn will be speaking there yeah. it's absolutely shameful shameful I, shameful I, I think that that's one of the things we need a, a real anti-war movement to bring yeah. this war to end yeah only definitely. international public opinion yeah. organized international public opinion could bring the war to we've end. got to scream and shout until it does end and we all have a stake in it ending uh, because it is one of our the great human tragedies of our of our time you've got half a million people dead uh, until now in the past five years you've got 11 million people displaced many of them coming to Europe and facing really horrendous situations. There was a recent report on children being living in awful situations in Greece, for example, children refugees. I've just read a report in Denmark in a, in a city called Aarhus, uh, where they're actually having separate classes for refugees as well as for uh, Danish-born citizens who come from migrant parents, segregating, separating them out. And that segregation, discrimination, hallmark of the uh, right wing and Islamist movement as well. Mm. We'll have, we've had recent last week in Iran that in the city of Shiraz, mm. uh, police rounded up supposedly um, uh, a group of criminals. Incidentally, they were all Afghan. They paraded them on the street and blindfolded them in cages and uh, humiliated, humiliated everybody all of those uh, arrestees um, publicly and that's uh, outrageous. And again, it's, it goes to the situation of Afghans in Iran facing huge amounts of discrimination. In many cities, they're not allowed to get housing, they're denied education, they're not allowed to enter parks in many. So this, the criminalization of the migrant population in Iran is similar to what we see by far-right groups here in Europe against migrants who are coming here. And incidentally, you know, there was a, a recent report of um, um, in Fallujah where ISIS had left the area and they ISIS had cages where they had put prisoners and it's very similar to the cages that the Iranian regime had put uh, the Afghan refugees in. And that, that, that's shameful. Um, can we just mention, if we have time, yeah. Nazanin, yes. uh, uh, Ratcliffe, um, Zaghari. Who, Zaghari, who was uh, recently 
um, secretly, if, uh, I think, um, uh, sentenced to five years yeah. for no reason, just because Islamic regime of Iran wants to threaten dual nationals and supposedly yeah. hold them as hostage to bar as a bargaining chip international. Yeah, and there's a couple of uh, such cases, such as Homa Hodfar, uh, Siamak Namazi, Bagher Namazi. There's several cases in which people are being held hostage uh, because of whatever wheelings and dealings and, and people are innocent and they all need to be released immediately without condition. We met Keith Porteous Wood, the executive director of the National Secular Society, recently at the 150th anniversary of the NSS at a wonderful event in London. Here, Keith speaks about the history and the importance of secularism for Britain as well as internationally. Stay with us. Keith Porteous Wood, it's wonderful to have you on our program. Well, I'm delighted to, to, to appear on it. Thank you, and we're just so Please, that it's the 150th anniversary of the NSS, the National Secular Society. Tell us what that means practically for British society and for the world in general. Well, the National Secular Society has been surprisingly influential in a lot of ways, sometimes not ones that would be understood or expected today. Um, but it hasn't been a monolithic organisation. There's always been a little bit of tension between people who want to be more atheistic and other people who want to be more uh, human rights orientated or um, looking for an equal society for everyone regardless of their belief or none. Um, and what will surprise a lot of your, uh, those watching this program was that it was quite early in the uh, NSS's history that they were looking at personal rights and, and what have become human rights and it's an area that the religious often try and pretend was something that they invented and, I, and certainly in, in, from social history terms it does look that we were very much at the forefront of that. And uh, Another big misconception is that the National Secular Society was kind of born in, in, in 1866 as, uh, and then had branches, but it didn't. It was actually, it came out from the bottom with local societies that had um, uh, secular agendas, often Owenite, um, Carlisle people, and, and a lot of interesting and subtly different organizations. And one of the things that united them um, was uh, freedom of expression um, and, and indeed very often um, a lot of impatience about the imperiousness of the established church. But I was always struck by how many of them actually had their own premises. Why did they have their own premises? Because the established church was so dreadful in, in stifling their freedom of expression, they actually put pressure on landlords and people in charge of public buildings to uh, forbid them to let to us. So to be able to express ourselves, we actually had to have these, these, uh, these, these many buildings, one of which still remains in Leicester. Um, and, and my favourite picture of, of Bradlaw is, is of one of him um, in Devonport, I think it was, on a boat just outside the low tide area and the jurisdiction of the of the local police and you can see the local police in the background looking greatly displeased that Bradlaugh was standing on this boat addressing a large crowd. Ah, so ex-Muslims should start <laughs> having events on boats. <laughs> yes, absolutely, just offshore. But it tells us a lot about the climate that there was there. So. Um, as well as human rights. Another aspect that uh, would be surprising was that Bradlaw uh, and Annie Besant were very much involved with contraception. Uh, now there wasn't a problem with contraception as long as it wasn't for the masses and their great crime, and, and indeed they did, uh, was the subject of legal action, 
was a leaflet called The Fruits of Philosophy, which is obviously a euphemism, um, and was, I think, a sixpenny uh, leaflet uh, I, available to, to, to everyone of, of whatever class. And that really was something that they were hated for more than for the uh, for the atheism and, 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 and certainly in Radlaw's case for his republicanism. And so um, that, uh, it was, it, we find it difficult to understand why there should be so much adverse reaction to that today. But, but it was encapsulated by someone who said, oh, to, to have used contraception uh, with your wife is, like, is to treat her like a whore. Uh, and that's something that we find very difficult to understand now. But as with so many things, they were so much ahead of their time. And that's never a comfortable position to be in. And, and this conference you have, this is to celebrate your 150th anniversary. Why the slogan, Living Better Together? Well, uh, I, I referred to the subtle differences between uh, the, the, the founders, uh, particularly uh, Bradlaugh, who concentrated more on on atheism uh, uh, and republicanism and, and, and radicalism, um, and that's understandable given the overbearing uh, power of the church at that, uh, that time. And I, uh, but there was also Holyoke, who was very much more into make, looking for an equal society where everyone was was uh, valued. And, and not discriminated against but on the grounds of their belief or not. Very much more the way that the National Secular Society has evolved in recent years. Because we've come to the conclusion that just trying to persuade people that God doesn't exist or, or that, their, room, that their, their beliefs are illogical or, or um, something similar, it, 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 A is that it doesn't succeed and B we're not sure it actually achieves anything. Um, they can, as far as we're concerned, people can believe what they like, provided that it doesn't adversely impact anyone else. Um, and, uh, and that opens us to a much broader uh, group of people, included that we've, we've got a, even a vicar uh, in our membership now. And, um, and so that's, that's a, a relatively modern development that, that, that we, but harping back to the beginning, which is really uh, plays into the title that we chose uh, for today's event. And also, I mean, it's interesting, 150 years, but the work is still so relevant today, isn't it? It's sometimes worrying about just how similarly relevant it is, um, both to the original work uh, and, and another golden era of the NSS was in the 1960s, well, 50 years ago, um, where they had a secular education week and they were arguing about the thought for the day and the exclusion of non-believers from that all right it was a different name of program but it's exactly the same issue and it's a little depressing that 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 we've had we've fought so long on these issues and the establishment has uh, has stuck so uh, rigidly and and, and uh, has refu refused to, to uh, move despite really good arguments and, and one of those uh, was to do with um, compulsory acts of worship in, in, in schools and that's something we've been arguing against you know, for, forever um, and, and in, in the, with the new uh, conservative government with their first education act we pushed that very very hard to the point that uh, the bishops ran back to I uh, Gove and said hey they're winning they're winning please help us and he like a lot of people uh, secretaries of state for education before him said don't worry we won't let them win and yet it was just last month that the United Nations uh, issued uh, a recommendations to the UK government to say that that should stop and that children should be able to choose themselves to whether to be able to withdraw from it, another big point that we've made. Uh, so again, we've been ahead of our time and uh, the United Nations thinks we're right but we have this intransigent government and it doesn't always matter which uh, hue the government is. There is a kind of uh, subservience to religion um, 
from both the main parties um, and I think they don't quite realize that, that the, the, certainly the Christians can't deliver votes for any one party and I don't think they have the religious clout. The NSS has just published a manifesto for change. Can you tell us what the main points are in this manifesto? We wanted to say something detailed and positive about, about secularism and what it meant because the, there is a great deal of ignorance about what secularism means. And I think that our, uh, those particularly in religious organizations who uh, feel uncomfortable about secularism because it quite often clips their wings, uh, very often deliberately misrepresent it. So we thought it was a good idea to set out positively what secularism meant. So, for example, we were particularly concerned to say uh, what the impact of secularism would be on education because education is the place where uh, the absence of secularism most impacts on the average person and for example uh, the admission to these publicly funded um, schools representing a third of the, of the schools in the country can be uh, discriminated on religious grounds and uh, as bad also that the teachers um, can be discriminated against on religious grounds obviously if they're not of the faith of the school or they're non-religious. Now how religious do you have to be to teach science or languages or the arts? Uh, you don't at all and it's just pure discrimination and when it's publicly funded uh, institutions it's doubly bad um, and on such a scale. Um, we also wanted to reaffirm our historic uh, support for freedom of expression which is the fount of democracy uh, which has been a long-standing National Secular Society uh, objective going right back to the beginning. Um, we wanted to express too our concerns about the continuing attacks on the law to increase the elements of religious exemptions, um, so-called conscience clauses. Uh, and uh, we, not so long ago, went to the European Court of Human Rights uh, to argue against evangelical Christians trying to get religion at the top of a hierarchy of rights, for example, to be able to discriminate uh, against gay people, whether uh, in, in um, counselling or in uh, uh, marriage, uh, civil marriage, it was absolutely outrageous. And so we won those cases, uh, and that it was really very important that we that we did that. And finally, we we wanted to take a, a look at the United Kingdom uh, in the public sphere and the the uh, the big ceremonies that take place that are extraordinarily religious still uh, and the, the biggest of those is the accession of the head of state the coronation of the new monarch and that is actually a religious service and there is no other western country where the act of succession which should be something to unite the whole country and an opportunity to unite the whole country where everybody's there on an equal basis is still at an Anglican uh, religious service um, and to give you a, uh, an idea of the relevance of Anglicanism on an average Sunday there is only between one and two percent of the population who are sitting on an Anglican pew so for, the, for that to be the basis of the accession of the, uh, of the monarch um, it, it, it is quite dreadful. Okay, thank you so much. Congratulations, and here's looking to another 150 years for the NSS. Uh, well, let's hope our job is done, but I suspect <laughs> yes. that, uh, that uh, that's rather optimistic. But thank you very much thank indeed, you. Mariam. And I'd like also to say how much I appreciate uh, Bread and Roses and what a wonderful uh, service it, that it that provided through you. 
um, and, and how interesting the programmes are and I'm sure they're very much appreciated by your enormous audience. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the interview with Keith Porteous Wood. I think he raises so many important points. For me, one of the important points was the fact that at the beginning of the establishment of the NSS, there was a lot of focus on challenging religious ideas, atheism, and it reminded me of the sort of challenge to Islamists today and the importance of criticism of Islam, whilst, of course, secularism is not necessarily being anti-religious. but. Being anti-religious is quite useful as well. Absolutely, I think that's it's got in, in its in its role in society. Uh, challenging religious ideas is important, but secularism yeah. as a protection for everybody. I think that that's important. Both believers and non-believers, everybody receives protection from uh, secularism, and that's an important role that National Secular Society and organisations like that have in society. Well done, NSS. We're proud of your 150 years. The insane fatwa this week is very, 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 very serious. And it's from Mufti Muhammad Ali Nazir Qadri, something like that. Oh, from India. From India. Who basically... Dargah Ali or Hazrat, Hazrat something, Bareilly. something, yada, yada, yada. Who has basically said that debating on TV is haram. Because TV is haram and videos are haram. How has he seen TV? If he's haram, how, how does he decide? He must have seen something. He's looked at it like this, and then he's like, oh my God, this is haram. No, I think he took part in the debate. And he lost. And lost, and I thought, beat the thing. hell out of TV, because that's what they do. I mean, in some <laughs> parts of the Islamic, sort of Islamic rhythms, where Islamists are, uh, you know, very powerful, they throw a TV in the middle, and stop with the stick start. There are actual pushing. videos, proof of this, if and fibers are trying to find it, find it where sure. they're beating the crap out of the TV because most probably the uh, Mufti yada 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 lost a debate on TV and the poor TV has to suffer. Yes. So, you know, if you go and debate on TV, it's not right. Don't do it. Stop it now. Our slice of life this week is a wonderful video of two women in Iran playing musical instruments with such passion. And of course, we have to remind viewers that in Iran, music is discouraged. Many forms of music are banned and particularly women and, you know, singing or playing instruments is frowned upon and even illegal in some aspects, yes. isn't it? Um, the future of uh, Iranian society will be decided by these young people and that brings us to end of our program for this week. Yes, we're going to end with this beautiful video. We hope you enjoyed this week's program and we'll see you again next week. Until then, goodbye.
Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.